Yeah, so before the break, we were looking at this prayer, the second prayer that Paul prayed for the uh, Ephesian believers. And um, uh, we kind of looked at four prayer points that he has prayed for them. Uh, and they're mentioned in your notes, so you can always go back and look at that. Uh, and uh, so he says, I've been praying all this. I mean, I, I'm praying these prayer points for you. So that he comes to us 19, he says, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So that, you know, in every way you will become just like Christ. You will be filled in to the full, the, uh, in the same way Christ is full of who he is, you too should become full with him to that extent where you literally uh, think the way he thinks, uh, you respond to situations in the way he does, uh, you show love to people in uh, and compassion in the way that he does. So, you know, um, uh, I'm praying these prayers so that you will actually genuinely become Christ-like, where everything that God is, all of his nature, will be manifested in your lifestyle. Uh, so uh, this is my prayer for you, is what he says. Now, a big part of the fullness of God is his love, the way he treats us and the way he looks upon everyone, you know, I mean, not just believers, even unbelievers, this love that he has. And that's a very, very important aspect of who he is. So anyone at all who says that they want to become Christ-like, they, they would have to tackle with this aspect of love. Um, and that is why Jesus emphasizes that, you know, when... Um, when he's talking about abiding in him, he says one 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 absolutely basic thing that you would have to do if you want to abide in me. You know, he says in uh, John, John chapter 15, uh, verse 12, he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That's one basic commandment that has to be kept if you're serious about abiding in Christ. And uh, when we, when we uh, looked at Galatians also, we saw that same idea, you know, kind of being reflected uh, where it says in uh, Galatians 5 verse 14, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you know, and uh, then in, even in Galatians chapter 6, uh, when we were looking at um, yeah, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, where it says, bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, so again and again, uh, emphasis is placed on is on, on this aspect, that if you want to, be, uh, to, re to reflect the fullness of God, uh, then you would have to be living in love. You know, that's just kind of understood. Uh, so it is possible to love in that way only when we realize how loved we are because then we are filled with gratitude I know because we are aware of our defects we are aware of our weaknesses we are in fact aware of the different ways in which we have betrayed the Lord's trust you know we have sinned so we are aware of these things and when we look at the love that he has Know, and we realize how much grace has been extended to us in spite of who we are, in spite of the things that we have done, you know, uh, that will make us really grateful. And then when we look at another believer who is not very nice, you know, we, we feel that um, empathy rising up in our hearts. We look at that person and we think, yeah, I was exactly like you. I was in the same pathetic condition. And the way the Lord you know, loved me and showed mercy towards me. So yes, even though you're being uh, very troublesome right now, and um, it's quite irritating the things that you're saying and doing, I too was exactly like that. And the love that I received, I think I need, I need to show that same kind of love to you. And we give them a second chance. We are not... Uh, we're not, we don't just write them off or we don't just take out our anger upon them. We, cho we choose to show them compassion. So this is not a learning which I have really been able to learn much. Hopefully next year when I teach this course, uh, I would have, you know, maybe advanced a little more in this. But I'm just kind of beginning to catch a glimpse that compassion, you know, is something that you are able to express because you have learned it, uh, uh, you know, you have experienced it. 
I mean, when when I look at the ways in which I have failed again and again, and the compassion with which Jesus dealt with me, you know, being so patient, he must have been quite disgusted and irritated with my attitude sometimes. I mean, you know, because sin doesn't appeal to God in any way, it disgusts him. So me indulging in such things would have been a most repulsive thing for him to look at, you know, my attitudes and the things that I do and all of that. But whenever I, you know, I needed a second chance, there he was immediately right by my side, extending compassion to me. And so after having experienced it again and again, now I'm a little more sympathetic towards other people when I see them, you know, and when I look and, and when I'm really angry or irritated with someone, the thought enters my head. Yeah, this is what, you know, you did to Christ. But look at the way he treated you. And it kind of, you, you know, because now you have experienced his love and you know what that compassion feels like, you know, you're like, you're like, yeah, I know. I think I should extend the same compassion now towards this person. So you choose to be gentler in your attitude towards that person. You're also more careful in your thoughts regarding that person. Earlier, you might have been, you know, just filled with all kinds of angry, hateful, uh, you know, grudging uh, thoughts towards that person. But now, uh, you, you know, whenever those thoughts come into your mind, you tell yourself, no. Is this how Jesus Christ thinks about you? In spite of all that you've done, look at the way he thinks about you. I mean, think look, look at look at the look at the thoughts that he thinks towards you. You know, just open to Ephesians and look at those two prayers and realize how what he thinks, you know, for you. That is the kind of thoughts that he thinks. So, what right do you have to be thinking all these evil thoughts, you know, towards that person, to the towards the other person who's kind of you know wronging you right now? So, this is something that you kind of learn through experience, even as you ex you you uh, become the recipient of this compassion and this love again and again, and you begin to appreciate what is being done for you, you kind of kind of become little ready to extend the same thing to other people because you have uh, been literally wallowing in that beautiful love. And you know, you, you just feel like showing that to the other people as well. So, like I said, I've not quite arrived in this area of my life, but I'm really seriously, you know, I mean, asking the Lord to help me in this. Uh, so, God will build us up, you know, in these things. For Him, um, loving other people, the way we are with them is absolutely vital. It's like very, very basic, very, very foundational. So, you know, if you're thinking in terms of um, being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, this is one aspect that you would have to seriously consider. How are you in your uh, attitude and in your relationships towards other believers? Uh, so that is very, very important. Um, yeah. So uh, after having you know uh, prayed this prayer, Paul goes on to you know speak words, uh, the, the verses twenty and twenty-one. So if someone could read out verses twenty and twenty-one, please. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation, forever and ever. Amen. So he has, you know, uh, finished praying the prayer, the second prayer, and he says, you know, now you know this prayer. I'm, I'm committing it the, into the hands of who? Into the person who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or Im imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. So it is that kind of resurrection power that is working in you, efficient believers. So I know for a fact that what I have prayed for you will be accomplished. You know, So in fact, he's going to do things for you that are beyond your imagination. So it's kind of a little sad when we take the scripture and we just kind of you know add it uh, to material needs over here there's some so much more being talked about yes he will take care of our needs you know in fact we have scriptures which specifically talk about the material aspect of, of what god has to offer so he says out of his riches he will provide us uh, with every need that we have yes but over here it's not just talking about some material needs that are getting met it's talking about how he's going to make you christ-like about how an 
ordinary person like you uh, can is going to become um, into someone who is reflecting him in all of his fullness in, in different areas of your life and people look at you and they can literally see christ in you when when you go and you interact with them and you try to help them out they literally feel god's presence through you i mean that's so amazing right because at the end of the day we're all just people it is so ordinary but um because god has been changing us so much and working on us so much on the inside when people interact with us they actually feel him you know rather than just you know feeling us they literally feel his presence and uh, so there are amazing things which are being talked about over here you know in these verses so i feel that you know verse 20 should not just be taken to talk about how you know he's going to provide us with material things and he's going to look after our needs uh, yes there is that beautiful aspect of it um, you know uh, where god will be meeting our needs but there's so much more that's being discussed over here. So let's look at these verses in the broader, you know, perspective. Uh, uh, let's take them in the way they were meant to be taken when Paul actually wrote them down. So yeah, that's uh, that's basically Ephesians chapter three. So very quickly moving on to ch into chapter four. Um, it's a um, kind of um, um, reaffirmation, repetition of you know the, of the things that he has already been saying. Uh, so maybe we can just read one entire chunk. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Fine. Before we get into the chapter four, then maybe you know we can first go ahead. No, it's not at all clear. You have raised your hand. Um, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I was just. Sorry to draw you back again. I don't know if you could just throw more light on verse 9 to 10 of Ephesians mm -hmm. chapter 3, just before we move to chapter 4. I don't know if you can just throw more light on verse 9 to 10. Yeah. Uh, so 9 to 10 would be, and to make everyone see uh, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Uh, yeah, right. Um, here uh, it's talking about, I mean, we, we saw, right, that the mystery is basically that um, uh, the grace of God has been extended not only to the to the Jews but also to the Gentiles and uh, now that mystery is beginning to be revealed and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places even these um, um, you know uh, the angels in heaven and uh, the evil principalities and powers, even they were not fully aware of what God had planned. And uh, so, you know, especially the evil principalities and powers, they had kind of held the uh, heathen world under their sway. They never thought that these people would ever escape from their hold. They could not do much about the nation of Israel. Yes, there were uh, you know attempts made by them uh, to kind of completely dissolve the nation of Israel and turn them into pagans just like everyone else. But again and again, you had prophets coming across, coming through, and you know there were revivals which took place. So the nation just somehow managed to hold on to Yahweh. Uh, so yeah, uh, the principalities and past did have their difficulties with the nation of Israel. But they thought at least the rest of the world is under their control. But now God finally reveals, you know, he's, he reveals it stage by stage, this mystery. And now finally, once Christ has accomplished his work, this um, the, the curtains are just literally opened up fully. And uh, it must have been a horrible, terrible shock uh, to the uh, heavenly rulers and authorities. Um, you know, the angels, of course, when they would see this, would have rejoiced. They would have praised and worshipped God. But the evil rulers, the evil powers, they would have been shattered, horrified, that now they don't only have to worry about the nation of Israel. Now they've got to start worrying about the entire world because they're going to lose their hold over every nation. People from all nations are going to start coming to Christ. They're going to be filled with his resurrection power. 
because when Christ exhibited his resurrection power on the cross, all these demons which were rejoicing and thinking, okay, now you know we he's finished, they could they could do nothing. Resurrection power is resurrection power. I mean, there's a great gap between divinity and created beings. And when God revealed his divine resurrection power, there was nothing that these, you know, these evil powers could do. They were helpless. And now that resurrection power is getting released into not just Jewish believers, it's going to be released into uh, Gentile believers everywhere throughout the world. And they're all going to become part of this body of Christ, this powerful new person that God is creating, you know, this church, the one body, the new man. That term is somewhere there. We'll, I think we'll be kind of coming to that um, in in our uh, you know uh, in our passage later on. So God is creating something extremely powerful for Himself, this church, this body of Christ. And so now the mystery is fully revealed that this was God's plan all along. That He's not just going to you know reserve one tiny little portion of humanity for Himself and just show them mercy, but His mercy is going to be extending to the entire world. And Satan is really not going to have a say in any of it. So uh, he now displays his finished plan. And it must have just caused the uh, evil powers to tremble. And so up to today, they are kind of engaged in battle, struggling, trying to make sure that we believers never catch sight of these beautiful truths. Because if we Gentile believers all over the world start catching this and start, you know, becoming Christ-like, then where will they be? They'll, they'll be nowhere. So um, so uh, it's like a declaration of victory. God, you know, revealing, throwing open his plans and saying, see, this is what I've planned all along. Not just salvation for a small bunch of people, but for all humankind. You know, so it's like God's royal declaration of, look, this is what I had, you know, up my sleeve all, all, all along, and here it is revealed. It's something glorious. It's something that God is, you know, declaring and proclaiming and saying, "This is what I actually accomplished on the cross." So it's more a declaration of uh, and proclamation of victory. Yeah, yeah, that would be verses nine and ten. Thank you very um, much, Pastor. Thank you. Yes. All right. So. Um, yeah, let's come into Ephesians chapter 4. Um, if someone could read out verses 1 up to verse 6, all the way from 1 up to verse 6, please. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humanity and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one yeah. of us according yeah, yeah. to the measures of Christ. Okay. okay, so verses 1 to 6, you have a whole bunch of ones being mentioned. Um, Paul is trying to you know bring out the fact that we are all under you know that we are all that all that we all have been made into one body uh, and we all you know are in, are being indwelt by one spirit and we all have one lord and master over us so it is one faith that we have placed in you know in one god and one lord and uh, so he's is bringing out the fact that we all are partakers of the same thing the same God and what he is offering. Uh, and we are equal partakers, you see. It's not like as if some people are being preferential, give, being given preferential treatment. All of us are equal partakers in it. So where's the need for comp competition? Where's the need for division and strife? You know, I mean, such things arise only if there's you know, in unequal treatment being, you know, um, you know, meted out, like it happened uh, in the case of, um, you know, uh, Joseph and his brothers. Uh, I mean, uh, those Old Testament people really were very bad when it came to family relationships. Seriously, I mean, if you look through the entire Old Testament, they were really bad husbands and really bad uh, fathers. Uh, you know, they just never caught many of the spiritual principles, you know, which we are so aware of now. Uh, so anyway, the thing is, I mean, see, at that time, 
uh, he was so busy giving preferential treatment to Joseph and Benjamin that the, all the other brothers, they felt bad. It must have hurt because after all, I mean, they're also his sons. And, uh, you know, just because uh, this man happened to love his, uh, you know, um, second wife more, it's not their fault. So all that created strife. It created division, this created discord. But here, you know, Paul is saying, all of you, Jewish believers and Gentile believers, you're equal partakers of this, of what God is offering. You know, you both have the same father, same heavenly father. You both have the same uh, one Lord who is, you know, who has sealed you with the same Holy Spirit. Uh, and he's making you to one powerful, strong, resurrection, power filled body. He's doing all that. So you guys are one unit. So there's no need for you to have some kind of sense of you know competition between each other or to have any discord or strife between each other. Realize your oneness and you know enjoy that, uh, flourish in that, uh, rather than you no know, picking on each other. There is no need for any strife or competition because in God's eyes you're all equal. You're all equally loved. You be and in fact then he goes on to you know talk about how the the grace which has been given, the the giftings which have been given. So all of you have your own beautiful giftings which have been handed to you, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile. So you you guys are all rich, equally rich, equally privileged. So there's no need to have any kind of division or strife, you know, is the point that he's trying to make over here. Um, uh, so then he starts talking about how uh, there have been special graces, you know, given to each person. And that is what he says in uh, verse 7. So if we can uh, read verse 7 once again. That grace was given. That grace was given to each one of us according to the measures of Christ's gift. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about how there were four kinds of grace, right? I mean, whenever the New Testament writers would use this term, they would use it in four different senses. Uh, so one of them we saw was uh, divine giftings. Divine giftings are also called grace. Because, I mean, we receive those gifts uh, by grace, right? We don't earn it. Uh, we They're just given it, given to us by grace as a free gift. Uh, so that is why even the giftings are also called uh, grace. And he talks about how each one of us, so every single Jewish believer has been given giftings, but every Gentile believer has also been given giftings. No one has been, uh, you know, given a been given a raw deal. Everyone is being showered with love to the same extent. Uh, so he says each one of us has been given, you know, these different grace graces. Uh, maybe we can say, you know, these different giftings have been given to us according to the measure, uh, you know, that Christ uh, decided to give it. And we will we look at that part, the the whole uh, measure thing as well. Uh, but the main point over here being made is that. All of us have giftings that have been given. Um, and then if we were to look at, you know, maybe Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 6, you know, just to kind of get a, a correct perspective regarding these gifts, Romans 12, 4 to 6, if someone could read out. For as in one body that we have many members, and the members do not all have the same functions. So we, though many, are one body, Christ, and individually members one, one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, a prophecy in proportion to our faith. Yeah. So uh, here, you know, in, in uh, Romans as well, Paul emphasizes, he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So we all have different giftings being given. And why have they been given? So that we can help the rest of the body. And we can you know, bring more people into the body of Christ. So that's the whole point in, uh, why the gifts have been given. Uh, so different people have been given different uh, giftings is the is what he says over here and uh, so in our uh, ephesians chapter 4 
verse 7 it says these this these you know the, these graces you know just me using the terminology over there it just talks about grace so this grace has been given to us in different measures um how does nkjv put it it says but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of christ's gift so some people uh, receive a larger measure some receive a lesser measure of a certain gift um not because there's any discrimination going on but just based on the uh, responsibility that has been given to you so if you have been given a larger greater responsibility to shoulder then obviously he needs to give you more grace he needs to give you a greater measure of that particular gifting to be able to fulfill your responsibility okay um on the other hand someone who has a smaller role to play would only be needing a lesser measure of that of that particular gifting um let's take an example um let's just look at colossians chapter 4 verses 12 and 13 which talk about a person named epaphras colossians 4 12 to 13 Colossians 4:12 to 14 Epaphras who is one of you a bond servant of Christ greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God for I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in loud this year and those in herapolis yeah look. yeah oh no that should be enough yeah thank you uh, so uh, we kind of get the idea that this epaphras is some kind of an apostle you know that's the kind of calling that he has received uh, why because you know he's been uh, establishing these churches so it's not paul who founded the church in colosse it was epaphras who founded that church and we kind of get the impression that he's also been establishing churches in laodicea and hierapolis okay so even in these places so he had an apostolic role uh, which he was fulfilling so which means you know he would have received the grace of um, the gifting of apostleship but just just me you know making my assumption you see the the measure in which he would have been given this gift of apostleship would definitely be lesser than the gift of apostleship that was given to paul because epaphras responsibility seems to have extended to this particular region you know where god had placed him to raise up churches in these areas so in colosse in laodicea in hierapolis in in in, in the surrounding areas is basically where he is supposed to raise up churches so god would have given him uh, a measure of the gift of you know apostleship apostleship uh, you know required to fulfill his role but paul on the other hand he was sent out on these missionary journeys which kind of you know went all over the place extended over or throughout asia minor so obviously paul would have needed a higher measure of that gifting right uh, so so in that sense different people depending on the responsibility that they have been entrusted with they are given uh different measures of the gifting so if you see over here it's got nothing to do with status when it comes to status we are all equal in christ we are all equally loved in christ there's no that doesn't that, that doesn't even get touched all that god is doing is based on the responsibilities that he has put on our shoulders he would give us his giftings his grace in different measures because some would be requiring more grace i mean a person um you know who is doing ministry among a very very difficult uh, people group you know where there's a lot of opposition where there's a lot of you know demonic control obviously that person would require a greater measure of grace in you know to do his ministry right than someone who is working in a area which is less challenging so um it would be the same with all giftings if it's the gift of prophecy some will have a greater measure of it depending on the ministry that they have been given and other person may have a lesser measure of the gift of prophecy you know because they uh, their responsibility is slightly lighter uh, easier to be able to uh, accomplish so yes yeah if if uh, yeah brother shay can go ahead and ask his doubt go ahead yes pastor 
I, I, I'm actually gaining insight into your um, explanation here. So it means, therefore, that um, depending on the task or assignment God gives a person, in person like Epaphras right now, um, it's a possibility that God could give you an apostolic grace, in other words, a pioneering grace to do something new or set up something new, but not necessarily being called into the office, if I can get you right. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, was uh, Epaphras given uh, that apostolic office of uh, of of being uh, an apostle? As in, God said, "This is what I want you to be uh, on a kind of full time basis," uh, or is it just something that he was doing on the side, even as you know he had a secular job and he was working at other things? Um, yeah, it's true. We do not know. It's not clearly explained to us here in what role uh, he was you know doing his ministry maybe he was just one of those uh, people who had other responsibilities you know placed on his shoulder by the lord but apart from those he also had to do this kind of apostolic thing so he was just doing it as one of his uh, responsibilities or who knows maybe he was one of those full time persons where god said you know i'm setting you apart for this task so yes you can earn your livelihood by you know doing other things but this will be your main focus this is going to take up most of your 24 hours because this is the is the official calling to which i have called you so yes we will very briefly maybe touch um, you know uh, as time permits if time permits uh, on uh, the you know the broader aspect of the gifts uh, so yes, we will try to look at that. But yes, yeah, uh, they, there is a differentiation. There is an uh, there is an official. There are some gifts which are officially appointed as full time gifts, and then there are gifts which all of us operate in a um, at a, at a membership level where we are all just members in Christ Christ's body, and we all perform our own individual functions. Um, yeah, we will get to that. Uh, but I thought maybe you know we would need to look at verses eight, ten, eleven, um, yeah, before we kind of get into that whole thing. So uh, we will get back to that, um, and you know we are kind of out of time as usual. But let you know, let's let's go through all of this quickly. So if someone can read out for us verses eight, um, eight, nine, and ten. Can I read, Pastor? Go ahead. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. He gave gifts to men in saying, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Yeah, so uh, here, I mean, um, it talks about how Jesus Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth and then he ascended, um, taking many captives along with him. And then in that process, he gave gifts to people. You know, he gave this grace, he gave different people different giftings. So um, this, uh, this is wrong doctrine that has come out of that. Um, there are some people who say that when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, he was, you know, cast into hell, and then he had to literally fight his way out of hell, and um, uh, so in that process he took many captives. Uh, but why on earth he would take the demonic captives to heaven? That doesn't make any sense. He would not do that. So you know, there's a lot of um, wrong teaching going on around this particular passage. So how do we understand this? What does it mean when it says that Jesus Christ you know, descended into the lower parts of the earth? So that's just something that maybe we should quickly touch upon. Um, so um, because we do know that he did you know, um, go down to the lower parts. So what do we mean by that? Um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, if someone could read out, 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20. First Peter 3, 19 and 20, and he reads, By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, 
who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few that is eight souls were saved through water. Yeah. Now, I don't really know much about these uh, things. I have not done extensive reading. So, uh, but so I'm not, I'm not really sure why Jesus Christ wanted to specifically, uh, you know, uh, go down into hell and declare his victory specifically to this bunch of people uh, who had, you know, uh, died and perished during the flood during the Noah flood. Uh, so, but I don't know, I mean, uh, it must be serving some spiritual purpose. So he goes down into the depths, uh, um, you know, of hell and announces his victory uh, to these imprisoned spirits, um, you know, which, which are, you know, lying in. So that we know. Okay. So we know that he did go into hell. But over here, when it's talking about how he has descended into the lower parts of the earth and he has taken captives from there, you know, and taken them to heaven, it's not talking about hell, okay? So here it is talking about something else. Uh, so uh, we 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 need to look into that. Uh, so what is the lower parts of the earth that is being discussed over here? Uh, it is you know suggested by many scholars that probably because you see these captives are going to be taken to heaven with him. So which means they are not um, sinful, uh, you know, uh, people on upon whom judgment has been brought. Rather, they seem to be good people. And he has set free these captives and is taking them to heaven. So what on earth is this all about? So they say that maybe it's talking about him going to this place called Hades, um, um, you know, which is actually referred to in our Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, where you have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And there you kind of get a glimpse behind the scenes of uh, uh, what actually existed in, you know, in the unseen world. Because that's literally what that word Hades means. The word Hades means unseen world. So in the unseen world, we kind of get to know from the Lazarus story that uh, there are two compartments. In one compartment, you have the people who have uh, you know, been uh, judged by God. And so they are being held over there uh, for the lake of fire. So one day, they'll all end up in the lake of fire that we know. But this is other compartment where you seem to have uh, Abraham and all of the other godly people, you know, the ones who trusted in God. Uh, and because they trusted in God uh, and followed him, it was credited to him as righteousness. OK, so they had not yet received the Holy Spirit and all of that in Old Testament times. But they decided that he has a heavenly home for them. So they held on to that hope and they they followed the Lord with that trust that one day he would you know even though they are unworthy he would you know save them so these are the kind of people who seem to be in the other compartment and uh, uh, so what is suggested is that jesus goes down to these to this compartment in the in the lower parts of the earth he goes to this compartment he collects all the people who i know have been stuck over there for centuries um, why? Because you see, they are, they, are, they are still captive under the law because the, the law, the Mosaic law, what did it declare? Even if you break one of the laws, uh, you know, even once, then you are, uh, you know, captive. You know, you, 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 are, you, are, you, are, uh, you, you, you can be judged for it. It's like as if, you know, you have sinned against God. So the Mosaic law applied to most of the people living in this compartment. It obviously would not have applied to uh, Abraham because Abraham was born before <laughs> the Mosaic law was even established. But you know, they all were staying over there as captive in the sense Jesus' finished work has not yet been done on the cross. So it cannot yet be applied to them. So they are kind of holding on. We have scriptures which are backing up what I'm saying. Uh, so we have Hebrews 11.10, where it talks about Abraham who is looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So, you know, uh, Abraham was looking forward to this, um, to this reward which is going to be given him, where he's going to be part of a heavenly kingdom. But he could not enter that kingdom immediately after his death. He had to sit over here in this compartment for the righteous. You know, in this unseen world, Hades, he had to sit in this uh, yeah, sit in this compartment, which was reserved for the righteous people. And um, so we see the same thing being talked about in Hebrews 11, 38 to 40, 
where it talks about all of these you know old testament uh, uh, people who remained faithful to god it says these were all commended for their faith yet none of them received what had been promised since god had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect so only when jesus christ comes along and he performs his finished work on the cross then along with us they too would be perfected they would be set free from their captivity in that sense and they would be jesus would collect them from paradise you know that this this compartment is called paradise the other part is called hell i suppose i mean i don't know the names the technical names but the thing is jesus would come into this you know this compartment for the righteous which he calls paradise and he would collect all these people and he would take them to heaven and as he's doing that he would release gifts to his people who are still alive on the earth you know the church he would impart gifts to them so that's basically what comes out in uh, in verses 8 9 and 10 which is why on the cross when you have the thief you know he says you know remember me lord when you come into your kingdom jesus says to me the kingdom will come and you know the king kingdom will come in the end times you know when when the lord will just establish it but tomorrow itself you know or does he say today today right oh sorry not tomorrow today today itself he says you know you will be with me in paradise because jesus is going to go over there to collect all his people and take them to heaven so at that point of time even this this uh, thief also would be there because, because of the faith that he has placed in jesus so he too would get collected along with all the all the other believers um the old testament believers and they would all go to heaven with him so that's basically what happened in verses 8 9 and 10 so in the process of him doing that the other thing so part one he collects his people and takes them to heaven because now they have finally been perfected like it says in hebrews 11 uh, verse 40. so he's going to collect them that's part one part two he also releases gifts to the church so um, um so he kind of interrupts himself and kind of brings in this this additional bit of information about when exactly the gifts were released and then he continues talking about the gifts okay so here in ephesians he continues talking about the gifts and my goodness we are like seriously out of time uh so very you know um so in verse 11 he talks about christ himself gave the apostles the prophets the evangelists the pastors and teachers so just to you know get back to what uh, the the issue that uh, brother shay had raised um in the new testament um you know we have we see three kinds of spiritual gifts being discussed uh, so we have different passages which discuss uh, different types of spiritual gifts um because we do not have time to cover all of that you know if you can just go to the apc uh, wo website and if you could download the book which is called gifts of the holy spirit uh, you would get a very detailed explanation about this okay so uh, we cannot get into details now as we have five minutes left but the book gifts of the holy spirit will give us a very clear detail about what exactly the new testament has to say about the different types of gifts and this is basically what we discover there are gifts which have been given to all believers Okay, so that would be 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11. Those nine gifts of the Spirit, they are meant for all believers. We are urged to, to desire them. We are urged to function in them. You know, so it's like open to all the believers. They are just the basic gifts of the Spirit, which are, you know, offered to everyone. And then we discover in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8, that some gifts are given specifically for believers to do their role in the body of Christ. So we are all meant to be together building up the, the church of Christ and we are meant to be bringing in new believers into this body of Christ for us to be able to perform our basic tasks. For instance, Epaphras, his duty was to use his apostolic gifting for uh, for for Stephen, uh, the gifting that was one of the giftings given to him was that you know he would function in this gift of hospitality, where he would be kind of helping out in that whole uh, distribution of food. So there are gift, different giftings given to different people, and what are those giftings being given for? So that you can perform your role in the body of Christ. If it is evangelism, that's what you would do. So this is given again to all believers. The basic nine gifts are given to all believers. 
the membership gifts are also given to all believers uh, but each person may have different ones so not everyone will be having an apostolic gifting not everyone will be having a prophetic gifting there will be different giftings you will have the gift of compassion there are some who can express compassion almost like jesus christ himself so that's a divine gifting we all have kindness in our heart but for them it's like a gifting that they actually flourish in and my goodness i really wonder what the church would be if we didn't have people like that you know they have an amazing special divine gifting of compassion and mercy we have uh, people who have the gifting of administration you know helps it's just called helps it's different kinds of helps including administration and all of these other technical you know logistic uh, related things those are special giftings that god has given so different members will have different giftings which they will use to build up the body and to bring in new believers into the body of christ and then you have these official what they call the official gifts that would be your apostle prophet pastor teacher evangelist now these are people who are expected by god to use most of their 24 hours for his um for the work which he is giving them now of course they can you know uh, run a business to support themselves they can go and find uh, you know employment in a secular place you know with the lord's guidance if the, if the lord helps them in doing that then yes they will support themselves by you know doing some job or the other but they are expect to to officially take this upon their shoulders they are meant so most of them opt to be full time because that makes it easier you know they can give all of their time but there are people who continue to you know earn the way paul did he was doing tent making to earn his livelihood but at the same time he took his apostleship apostleship responsibility very seriously because that was an official role given to him so these uh, five ministry gifts are um, given um, to uh, certain people and they are expected to use almost their entire 24 hours just for that that's a task that has been given to them officially placed on their shoulders okay so um, this uh, will not be given to the entire church because the entire church has you know other roles to play this will be given only to a few uh, you know a handful um, so that they can equip all of these other people who are actively involved in work okay so their main task like it says in um, where would that be verse 12 so ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 uh, so these five fold uh, you know uh, ministry people their responsibility is for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry so all of these believers who are you know busily going around using their membership gifts to you know uh, to do their own little bit for the kingdom of god someone needs to be there to kind of equip them and help them to do their particular task better and so these people the apostle prophet pastor teacher evangelist who are doing this particular gifting in a official role they will dedicate almost their entire 24 hours in helping these other prophets and you know apostles and all of them in developing their giftings further so that they can do the work of ministry so the main job of these people who have this official gifting of apostle prophet teacher they should be busy equipping other people to do their work you know uh, for the kingdom of god so the most of the 19 i suppose like you know 90% of the work will actually be done by the rest of the body of christ they are the ones with the giftings they have all been given grace in different measures according to what christ you know had decided and they are the ones who will be engaged in a lot of ministry work the 90% of believers will be doing that 10% are the ones who are meant to be equippers so they are meant to equip the others to do the work so they themselves don't really get much done in the sense you know they are too busy equipping the people but because of their the work that they are doing in equipping others the others are able to go out and accomplish the um, the purposes of the kingdom of god so um, this is just a very hurried way of you know going through this uh, you know but um, maybe we can just touch a little bit more uh, upon the rest of ephesians chapter 4 you no know, next class before we get into chapters 5 and 6 
Um, so there's really no time at all. So we'll just have to conclude. All right. So let's just pray. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that we could learn in our class today. Uh, we pray, O oh Father, that um, um, we will never think of ourselves as inferior, but begin to recognize that what you have written here in the scripture about us is true. It's the truth that we are indeed uh, filled with the resurrection power of Christ himself to become Christ-like, to be able to uh, manifest your fullness in, in all areas of our lives, to actually do ministry work. So we pray that you would help us to understand this and help us a lot to actually operate in these things. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And very sorry that we just had to rush through this. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Master.